glorious Easter Sunday. Regardless of what is happening in our world today, what is happening around the world and all the scares that's going on, Jesus is still Lord. God is still on the throne. In the midst of all that thing, the chaos, God is still on the throne. Whatever you may be going through right now, let me remind you that God is still God today. Whatever it is, he's still God over your sickness. He's still God over coronavirus. He's not scared about that. He's still God in our communities. He's still God in your home. And we believe in the resurrection. We believe uh, in the importance of celebrating the resurrection uh, because of what the resurrection brings to us and the difference that the resurrection makes in our life. He is risen. He is risen. What great truth. You know, he is risen. That phrase has given people hope for centuries and centuries, for hundreds and hundreds of years. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, after Jesus was crucified and put in the tomb, Scripture says that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, uh, uh, the mother of James, and Salome came to the tomb on Sunday at sunrise. They came to the tomb, and they saw that the stone was rolled away from the tomb. And they saw a young man sitting there dressed in white, uh, in a white robe. And the young man looks at them and says, do not be amazed, for he is not here. Jesus of Nazareth, he has risen. Uh, those are incredible, exciting words. And for those who have been hopeless and discouraged, and for those that have been depressed and oppressed in, um, in search for something more, he is risen, or he has risen, brings hope. It gives people hope. It gives us hope. Even in the midst of all the uncertainty of life, even right now, he is, he is risen, gives us the hope that we can face tomorrow because Jesus is still God today. He's giving people hope, those that are battling with condemnation, those that do not know what tomorrow holds, those that do not know whether they are able to, uh, to avoid this coronavirus or not, is risen, gives us hope. And I'm praying that this morning that you'll be able to experience the hope of the resurrection. You'll be able to experience uh, the hope that Jesus brings into our lives, the, the hope that Jesus brings in our communities, that we will be able to experience that in the name of Jesus. So it's great news. Uh, this is the great news that changes everything. It changes the way we celebrate. It changes the way we carry ourselves. It changes the way we walk. It changes the way we do life. It changes the way we respond to the happenings of life. It changes the way we walk. So before we get into the word, I, I just want to pray as we begin. Let's all bow our heads in prayer wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I'm trusting you can all hear us live and direct. And so we're going to pray and ask God's leadership right now. Father, what a phrase. He has risen. What a savior to be crucified on the cross for the entire world. Uh, that whoever believes in you, he shall not perish but have everlasting life. What a savior. Lord, I pray this morning for those that are Christians. I pray that this day is a reminder of what you have done. That this day, may it remind us of the price that has been paid. May it remind us that it is all finished in the name of Jesus. May you restore our joy that we once had, Father. God, I pray for those that are in this room who don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. May today be the day that they meet you as their Lord and Savior. And surrender who they are to who Jesus is this morning, oh God. May today be the day. So, Father, we ask your spirit to fill every person the manifestation of your presence to fill every home. God, we give you this day to you. We deflect all the glory and all the honor back to you where it belongs. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And somebody out there said amen and amen indeed. God bless you. When Jesus died on the cross, many people asked the question, as I did before I became a Christian, why the cross? Why Jesus? If you study this, uh, the, the historian by the name Josephus, who was said not to be a Christian, uh, by the way, and, 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 the, and the debate is not whether Jesus is, um, uh, whether, Jesus, uh, whether or not Jesus was, uh, was a real person. The debate is whether he was Lord, uh, whether he was the, the, the Messiah, whether he was the Savior of the world. That's where the debate is, whether he's the Son of God. So when Jesus was put on the cross, at this point, the Romans had perfected 
persecution. Uh, they stole it from the Persians. Uh, the Persians created a form of persecution in 350 BC, uh, and the Romans perfected it in 100 BC. Uh, they had plenty of time to perfect uh, this thing, and, and what they would do is they knew how to torture individuals uh, close to death, uh, but they didn't want them to die on the spot. They didn't want them to die quickly, and they wanted them to suffer and experience the sufferings as long as possible. For example, what they would do is they would put people on stakes and burn them alive, uh, but they thought, no, they are dying too quickly. Uh, we're going to figure out something else. So they, 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 they would bury people alive. They come up with this idea, we are going to bury people alive, and they would bury people alive, and they thought, still, no, people are dying so quickly. So they began to study the human anatomy. They started to the human anatomy of our body, uh, and they begin to study what could they do to, to a person to give them the most punishment without necessarily killing them quickly. And, and that's where crucifixion comes into play. What they did to Jesus specifically is that they stripped him uh, off his clothes. So here he is in front of hundreds, uh, literally. Historical documents say two to three million uh, people are here at this time. They stripped Jesus naked. And as they stripped him naked, he gets on the floor. They begin to... To give him, to, to, to whip him. They get this whip. It's called the cat of nine whips. The cat of nine tails, which the end of the whip, it had this razor blade, sharp glass or bone. And what it would do is when they would begin to whip Jesus in the back and it would take out the flesh off of Jesus. It would take out the muscles and the tissue from Jesus' back. And it would come over right to the front, cling to his body, and pull out the flesh as well. Uh, they did it over and over. They knew exactly how many whips to do before he died. But if, if, the, if the person would begin to pass out, they would get a bucket of salt water and, and, and pour it on them so they, could, they can feel it on their wounds and wake them up so that they could prolong the pain and they would go through the pain over and over again. Then they, would, they, they weren't finished. They would then put a beam on the back. Uh, the vertical part of the beam of the cross was already at its destination point. So they put a beam on his back. Uh, the beam weighed about 110 pounds, and, and he would carry the beam and all the way throughout the city of Jerusalem so that everybody could see, uh, who see this would know, don't mess with the Romans. Don't mess with the Romans. If you mess with the Romans, this is what you're going to go through. You have to obey the Romans. So when they got to the point of being hung on the cross, they laid Jesus on the floor. Then they took nails, which some historians say the nails were between seven to nine inches long. And they would put it right here on the wrist, right here in what some historians believe, on the wrist. Uh, and now, scriptures doesn't say on the wrist. When you read scripture, it says um, hands. So when you look at your scriptures, it says they put nails on his hands. But that's just because there was no Greek word for hands, so this word hand is used interchangeably between the finger, the palm of the hand, and the wrist. So scholars believe that it was the wrist that they put this, um, uh, this, these nails. Because between the radius and the ulna on your hand, they would put it right here, um, which would then hit the meridian nerve that right run on your hand, and it would send a lava of pain right to the whole rest of the body. And the person would then quickly um, die. Uh, so, so what they would do is that they would put these, um, put their legs on the, um, on the, on the, on, on the. Uh, they would put their legs on the, um, um, on their feet. They would not just, be, you know, crucify them with their legs apart, but they would cross them so that actually they would be able to last longer on the cross. So they cross their legs. If you see some of the images that you've seen, you'd see Jesus' legs being crossed um, so that he would last longer. Uh, and then they would figure out, uh, you know, we have to do this so that the person will prolong the death and that he will suffer a little bit more. The longer they take to die, the more pain and suffering that they would endure. So here is Jesus on the cross. And what they would often do is they would put a board underneath the feet 
so that when the person is becoming crucified, he would be able to breathe in, and as he breathed in, and he would be able to push on on those blocks underneath their feet and be able to prolong their life again. So Jesus is on that cross. And when you read uh, scriptures in John chapter 19, and this is what I want to focus on this morning, when Jesus was on the cross, the gospel of John says that in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Jesus' last words is this, that it is finished. And I was always praying and reflecting over that. And I pray that these words would become and would ring in your hearts, in your minds, in your home, in your nations, wherever you are watching us today, wherever you are. These words, the last words of Jesus, it is finished. May they ring words, may they actually become prophetic in your life that it is finished that this coronavirus is finished in the name of Jesus because Jesus went on the cross and died. Now, those three words are a real package deal for Easter. Those three words, it is finished. Jesus' last words. That's the only thing I want you to remember today. If you forget anything, I want you to remember these words, it is finished. In fact, tell the person next to you, it is finished. And begin to pray over that, that it is finished in the name of Jesus. It is finished. Uh, and some people question and say, did he say, oh, oh it, it is finished. Or oh, Jesus declared, it is finished. Uh, but I want to think that he declared it, that it is finished. It's gone. I am finished. It's done. Now, I want us to zoom in over that, those words. This word in the Greek is called tetelestai. Can you say that after me? Tetelestai. That it is finished. To tell us, die. Uh, you see, uh, this was a common word in this culture. Uh, they would use it uh, in several different ways. When the worker would go out to the fields, and when they finished the work, they would come back to their master, and he would go to the supervisor and say, "To tell us, die. I'm done. I'm, I'm gone. I'm, I'm done. To tell us, die." Uh, when the judge would have a criminal. Um, come before him. Once the criminal has served his sentence, has served his time, the judge would bang the gavel and say, Tetelestai, you have served your debt and your duty. They found this on documents going back to the New Testament, uh, that when somebody would pay their taxes and, and pay their bills off, what they would end up doing is they would stamp this word to, to their bill. It, it paid in full, to tell a star. Uh, then artists during their time of, of painting, when they finish their artwork, when they do the last brush stroke, uh, what they would do, and they would say, to tell a star, I'm done. The priest, when the priest would bring a lamb on behalf of the people, uh, because when you look at the Old Testament, because of the sins of the people, they had to be forgiven uh, in the spiritual law. Uh, so what they would do is the high priest would bring a perfect lamb to God to appease his anger towards the people who had sinned. And when he brought the lamb before God, they would slaughter the lamb and he would bring the lamb before God. And when he could, when he could, uh, when he could, when he would come out to know that the lamb was taken from God and God accepted the sacrifice, uh, the high priest would say, Tetelestai. You are forgiven, Tetelestai. So if Jesus is uttering his last words and he's saying Tetelestai, this word Tetelestai means finished. It means paid. It means it's complete. Uh, what, Je what is Jesus talking about? What is complete? What is finished? What is paid? And there are three things he's talking about, and I'm, uh, I'm going to go through those three things, and I'm done. He's risen. Number one. That Jesus is going through uh, is, is that the sacrificial system, the sacrificial system. You see, they had to wait for the entire year on the day of atonement to bring the lamb, the perfect lamb, to be forgiven for their sins. Uh, uh, there is a religious system put in place in order for people to know they were okay with God, to know that they were accepted with God, to know that it God loves them. So when Jesus said it is finished, what he is saying is that sacrificial system no longer have to play religion. You don't have to play religion. You don't have to, to go and do all these things. It is done. The system is complete. It's stopped. 
it is through Jesus, it is through the Son of God, sacrificial system had to go. So the sacrificial system was removed. We no longer have to, to bring poor sheep and to be offered. There is one lamb that came and that perfect lamb was given for the forgiveness of your sins, my sin, that together if we put our trust in him, we are set free. But then there's a second thing. The second thing is death. I hate to break it to you, church. And I know this is resurrection message. Nobody can escape death. None of us. And do you recognize that we all have an expiration date on us that none of us can escape? Every single one of us of, uh, has got an expiration date. So in that moment, what was Jesus defeating? What was finished, Jesus? The power of sin and death. Scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. And Jesus is saying, Tetelestai, I have conquered even death. So that there is life after death for the one who places their life and their faith in Jesus. There is life after death. There is no more need for us to fear death because Jesus has said to tell us die to death. Jesus managed to overcome death. The third thing that Jesus is talking about uh, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a spiritual death that they took on, a debt that they couldn't pay. And, uh, but a debt that only Jesus could pay. And, and so when we sin, we incur a spiritual debt. Just tell the person next to you, when you sin, you incur a spiritual debt. And many of us have got that spiritual debt right now. And there's only one person who can pay that spiritual debt. And so when we sin, we incur that spiritual debt and we carry on. We carry this debt. So what Jesus was saying on the cross uh, that I paid for the debt of humanity who can't pay the debt themselves. I paid for it. Nothing can appease God but only the body of Jesus Christ. Nothing can appease God. Nothing can give you peace. Nothing can set you free. Nothing can give you hope. Nothing can make things right. Nothing can change. You can wash your hands all day you like. I'm not saying don't wash them, but I'm saying we only have peace and life in Jesus Christ. We only have peace and life, and we can only appease God through Jesus Christ. So this word, tetelestai, it is the perfect passive indicative tense. This is what it means. It means that in that moment that Jesus gave his life on the cross, listen to this, he automatically on the cross paid for the debt. On the cross, on the moment, Jesus paid the debt. He paid that cross. Uh, but what I love about this word um, is, 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 um, is that it's two meanings to it. The passive perfect passive indicative tense it paid it right in the moment but this word had a second meaning uh, that only those that that not only does it pay in the moment but it has the effect that's continual so it's not only uh, paid in that moment but it actually goes on paying so whenever you sin there is an ongoing payment if you choose to come back to repent and come back to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? That today Jesus is saying, Tetelestai, and he's saying it is finished. That whatever you did yesterday, that whatever you did last year, whatever you did this morning, Tetelestai, it is finished. Come, let us reason together. Let us come together and reason together. Turn away from your sins and repent because Jesus has paid the price. Let me make it a little bit, a little more plain for some of you. When Jesus died on the cross, this tetelestai, second meaning, it continues to automatic, it's an automatic withdrawal. It's an automatic, and what Jesus was said, he said, I am taking care of the debt and the sins of humanity. Uh, one of my, um, or my dad, I remember when he was wrestling with something and he wanted something paid. And I said, I am taking care of the debt. Uh, he was bothered by that and he was worried by that. And I had to step in and say, I am taking care of that. And pay it off and, and clear it off and to see the, the smile and see the freedom and the way it's taken care of. And so what Jesus was doing on the cross, he was saying, for you and Cam, 
for you, Esme, for you, uh, Emma, wherever you are, for you, uh, uh, Tisha, that Tetelestai, I am routing everything, I'm routing everything from your bank account to my bank account, Jesus is saying. And he's saying, whatever you do, it is finished, it is paid for. For you, Micah, Jesus is saying, whatever you do, it is paid for, it is finished, it is done. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whosoever chooses to put his trust in Jesus, Jesus says, Tetelestai. Can you just tell it to the person next to you, Tetelestai. Tell them one more time, Tetelestai. So Jesus is saying, I'm taking care of the debt and the sins of humanity. So anytime somebody believes in me, here's what I'm going to do to the Father. I'm going to tell the Father, this person right here who has placed their faith and trust in me, I took care of their debt. Jesus is going to go to the Father. And in fact, because this word is passive indicative, he also means he's going to go to the Father and say, Father, when you see this person come, you're going to see the blood. You're going to see the price that I pay because I cover that person in the blood of Jesus. So uh, we, he also means that go ahead and, and he hook it up and took our bank accounts, and, and now it's no longer us that live, but Jesus lives in us. And when God looks at us, because he says the wages of sin is death, he's going to see the blood of Jesus covered all of us. Because every time my son sins, God says, Jesus says, every time my child sins, my child falls, you go ahead and pull automatically from my account because I paid it with the blood of Jesus. Because the blood of Jesus not only covered the past, but it covered the present, and it, 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 it covers also the future sins that we commit. That's the picture of what's going on here. That's the gospel, and that's the good news, uh, that it wasn't only good for that moment when Jesus hung on the cross and he came back to life, but it covers your yesterday, it covers your today, and it covers your tomorrow. And when Jesus is speaking into your life right now, and he's saying, Tetelestai, he's saying, I paid for your yesterday. You don't need to walk in shame. You don't need to walk in guilt. You don't need to, to be defined by your yesterday. Tetelestai, uh, not only did I cover yesterday, but I'm covering the sins that you're committing today. And I'm covering the sins that you're committing tomorrow. It's Tetelestai. Now, how do we know that Jesus took the sacrifice? That Jesus took that sacrifice. How do we know that God took the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? Uh, where is the proof? The tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. He is risen. That is the receipt uh, that say that paid in full, it is accepted. That is the receipt that says your sins are covered, are taken care of. That is a, a receipt that assures us and gives us that assurance that it's no longer I that lives. I love that hymn that we sing, because he lives, I can fast tomorrow. Because he lives, I can fast tomorrow. Because he lives, I do not need to walk in fear, in discouragement, in wondering what's going to happen, what is the world becoming. Because he lives, you can fast tomorrow. Because of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, you have hope and a future. And, and I want to encourage you this morning with that. Now you may be here thinking, is that really true? Does God really work that way that you believe in him and no matter what you have done, he wipes it away and he forgives? It sounds too easy, you might be thinking. Is, is that really true? Can God do that with my life? Can God change my life? Can God restore my life? I want you to pay attention to this testimony that we're about to hear. I want you to pay close attention to that testimony and hear the life, the transforming power of Jesus, the transforming of how Jesus changes our lives and brings about a hope and a future. Check this out. I grew up in a very normal household with two loving parents and they look after me perfectly fine. Um, when I became a teenager, I got very rebellious. Um, I started to take drugs, um, drink a lot of alcohol, and party a lot. So, because of that, I became addicted to drugs 
and I was going downhill fast. I um, I used to take drugs till I used to feel that my heart would beat out of my chest. It was awful. It was a very um, lonely time because you start to distance yourself from friends that you had because they don't understand your lifestyle. You've now I actually made new friends, so to speak. So people who were my friends before they weren't friends with me now because I had changed and um, there was no one that I really could confide in or speak to so I just used to keep myself to myself but still um, taking the drugs and it was ruining me. Um, I before used to dress a certain way and carry myself in a certain way and I just became very um, the opposite, like I started to not care so much about myself and yeah, it was horrible, it was horrible. Um, I felt very empty inside, I felt very um, just, what was, what was it all about? I, I, I just didn't really enjoy life, I just became very low and um, one day I was sitting at home and a lady came and asked me if I did a certain type of um, nail. Um, I was a manicurist, I am a manicurist, um, so my job, um, by the, what, I, what I was doing, she was asking me did I do a certain type of um, style of nail. So she came to my home, she sat down and we talked and I was just looking at her and thinking what's changed because I'd known her for a good while and she seemed very calm, she just really different and then she said um, Emma I go to church now you know and I looked and I thought okay she said um, yeah I'm, I'm saved I, I go to church I've been baptized so I started to ask her questions and I just wanted to know more because I just thought if this lady can be so different then that means that I could I knew that there was something more for me so she um, explained to me that they have classes on a certain night of the week so two days later I went along and I was very inquisitive and I asked questions and they spoke to me and and just informed me and told me um, ministered to me about Jesus and I didn't know all this before I, I, I was raised in church and but I did not know this Jesus that they were talking about he all of a sudden became very real to me so I was asked, did I want to invite him into my heart and would I like to make him the Lord and saviour of my life? And I just answered yes, straight away, yes, why would I not want to, why? I was so low before that I, I was searching, I was searching in every direction, I was searching. So when they spoke about this Jesus, it was very real for me. So I think 10 days later I was um, baptised, they explained about baptism, I went and was baptised and I just remember even walking up to um, be baptised before I went in the in the pool and just I was overwhelmed with this joy and I just started crying and what I experienced, I just, I, it could only have been God. So. After that, I really um, started to experience change in my life. The things that I desired before, I didn't desire them really. Or I could say that I, I, less and less, more and more, I just wanted to live a different life to the one that I was leading. And that was God. That was God. It didn't feel like even in my own strength, it, it, it felt like I was being pulled in another direction, but in a good direction this time. So yeah, it, it was God. God was changing my life. God was transforming me. He was taking me from the person that I once was and now cleaning me up and making me into this into this new person, changing my lifestyle, changing the way I thought, changing just the way I, I saw life. It was amazing. And I know that it's Jesus, it's, it could only be Jesus, because that's what he came to do. And um, 
the peace that comes alongside with him is awesome. I used to, before, think that I was at peace. I wasn't at peace. I, there was no way I was at peace. I was, um, I was in turmoil before, but now with Jesus, I, I, I found peace. And what's fantastic is that anything I go through now, I still have my struggles. I still am challenged with things of life, but I can pray. I can speak to God. I can ask him for direction through reading the word, through calling out. I, and I know that he's real and I know that he wants to help me and I know that he is always there for me. He's given me a new lease of life and it's, it's beautiful. It's a gift and it's a gift that anybody can receive. It's amazing. That story is not possible if Jesus didn't die and rose again on the cross. You see, the empty tomb fills the empty soul. The empty tomb fills the empty heart. The empty tomb fills the empty life. You see, this morning, there is no doubt in my mind that some of us here, you can re relate to the story that we just had. Uh, you can relate to that first half of that story. The brokenness, the frustration, the pain uh, the, uh, from the decisions that you made. But you can't relate to the second half of the, transforma to the transformation that Jesus brings in a person's life once they choose to give their life to Jesus. Uh, you see, she was carrying a lot of weight. Uh, she was carrying so much. There was brokenness in her life. There was a debt that needed to be paid. Uh, there was a spiritual debt that she, was, she couldn't pay. When she gave her life to Jesus, the spiritual death no longer became a burden for her. Jesus paid the price for her. You see, there is somebody, some of us today here, that are carrying a spiritual debt uh, that you can't pay. That you're worried about your life and you're worried that if you die today, would I be able to go to heaven or not? Would I be able to be accepted in that if you were going to die today, where would you go? We all want to go to heaven, and everybody talks about heaven. But my friends, my brothers and sisters, can I remind you that only through life in Jesus would we only be able to enter into heaven. And I want to encourage you um, to consider giving your life to Jesus today. In fact, give your life today to Jesus and let Jesus transform your life. Let change your life. Uh, let Jesus give you the courage to take those bold steps wherever you are. I'm going to pray for you, and then uh, Mr. Combe is going to come and pray for us to finish. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray this morning, oh God. Thank you that you paid the price for us. Thank you, Lord. Give us the courage to receive you today. Jesus, I give my life to you. I surrender my all to you, God. It's no longer I. It's no longer about me, God. Thank you that you died on the cross and you paid the price. You paid the price, oh God, for me that I may have life. And today, Jesus, I receive you into my life. Come into my life and bring about peace and bring about hope and bring about a future that only you can give. Thank you so much, Father, for dying on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.